probably go ahead and get started. Do we need to do introductions? We can. Is it okay? Sure. Just trying to find this. So I'm Sue Lee. Yeah. I'm Sue Lee, and I'm the director of the Remediation Redevelopment Division, and I appreciate the chance to come on down and, and meet with you again. I hope to be doing more of this in the future. So I appreciate the invitation. Thanks for coming. Thanks for being here. I'm uh, Kevin Lund. I'm in the Jackson District. I've been around this Kristen Schwinkhofer. I'm the Environmental Health Director with Washtenaw County Public Health. Brian Nagel, Assistant Attorney General, assigned to this case. Jenny Khan, Washtenaw County Environmental Health. And the FYI, Dan Hamill with uh, Jackson RRD is on the phone. Mitch Edelman with the DEQ's Remediation and Redevelopment Division. Oh, by the way, the of Sino Township. Bryce Kelly, Sino Township, and I'm waiting for the cookies. <laughs> 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 you better send them this way first. At least that was <laughs> subtle. <laughs> <laughs> I'm Shauna Milkey. I'm a citizen of Ann Arbor, and I also serve as secretary for CURD. Great. Okay, so I'm taking some minutes. Mike Moran, Ann Arbor Township Supervisor. Uh, Matt Nott, Environmental Coordinator for Ann Arbor. Roger Rail. Uh, Sire Citizen, co-founder and chair of Sire Residence for Safe Water and chair of CARD. Thank you. Thank you. So Shannon, do you want to take it over the next two items? Okay, yeah, um, I, I move that the CARD board approve the minutes from the July 11th meeting. Anybody? Second? Second. Second? All right, so, so members of the CARD board, if you approve, uh, say yes. No. Yes? yes. Any no's? No? Okay. Uh, the minutes are approved. All right. Okay, on to DEQ updates. So, um, DEQ recently announced that they will be pursuing um, an update to Part 201 rule, specific to 1,4-Dioxy, and not with the entire 300 chemical rule package, so there's a, do you have more information on that and the sure. public meeting that's coming up? Sure, so um, in realization of the time that it's taken for the comprehensive package to go forward, which did contain and does contain one for dioxane, obviously, um, so we felt it was important to go ahead and move forward with just a single rule amendment that amends the groundwater number 414 dioxane ahead of the rest of what I'll call the comprehensive package um, because we're very concerned about allowing sufficient time and, and the comprehensive package potentially um, getting uh, immersed in a lot of uh, more discussions. So we felt that there would be less uh, concern with uh, just the one rule and thought it most expedient just to go forward with the 14 dioxane rule. So we put that forward. Um, it's gone through various portions of the process. Mitch has been instrumental in moving that forward. The public meeting is scheduled for the 22nd, as you've got down here, at from 1 to 3, I believe it is. And the comment period will close when that public meeting is over, or probably 5 o'clock that day, technically. Um, as of today, we have not received any comments, and public comment period is open right now, and we have not gotten any comments so far. Um, the schedule that we've got, so we always put together these schedules where we try and guess. Okay, so this is a guess. Yeah, you don't want to set there, you want to set some easy screen. You know what? You can set over here. So we've already sent the rule to the uh, rules administrator officer. We um, had the ORR slash legislative secure Science Bureau Review, Legislative Services Bureau Review. We sent the notice to the calendar. The rule has been published in the register. The public comment began on August 2nd. So we're in the throes of this. The um, public hearing notice should be appearing in the newspaper if it hasn't already. The hearing will be on the 22nd at Con Hall from 1 to 3. We've given ourselves a week to review any comments, and we have to write up a response in this document then. So basically, we respond to any comments, and we submit that as a package with a bunch of other forms to um, the uh, JCAR, the Joint Committee on Administrative Rules. And of course, our front office will need to sign off on that as well. 
we're looking at certification through an accelerated process, um, hopefully September 5th maybe, or at least right around there. And then, uh, so ORR and LSB get uh, like a week to do that certification process. And then we need to wait for 15 legislative days. So if nothing happens within 15 legislative days, then the rule is passed. JCAR also has the option of convening one time and, and voting to <coughs> waive the 15 <coughs> legislative days. So if they do that, we would expect the rule to be finalized sometime mid-September. If they choose not to do that, we would expect the rule to be finalized um, at the earliest on October 17th. That would be the very earliest, but it would depend on how many legislative days and how long it takes a few other things, so, which I don't know. So we're looking at mid-September, mid-October. Once that is done, we will um, immediately begin the comment period uh, for, we will immediately be submitting and start the comment period for the comprehensive rule package. Um, and then that will go through a 30-day public comment period. I'd like to let y'all know too that we've got that package just about ready to go and I know I keep saying that but you know it's important to get it right so we keep working on getting it right. I hope to have that available next week, the comprehensive package. Mm -hmm. um, we will be providing it to anybody who asks. I think we can put it up on the website as well. We are not allowed to take public comments officially yet because it won't be done through ORR. ORR does not want this until the 1-4-dioxane rule is completed because they apparently, I still need to talk to them, but apparently they don't, won't let us run two packages on the rule at the same time. Despite what they told us at one point in time. And you can tell them full sort of point with me, I'm not very happy about this. But I don't know the world. So um, we're just trying to deal with that. And um, so that would put um, the what that does, though, is it gives people even more time to review the comprehensive package. So let's say that the comprehensive package gets out next week. That means you've got till mid-September, mid-October to review it and think about things before we can put it out for official public comment. So in that meantime, and during the public comment period, the department's intent is to go around and do some information sessions to talk about the real package. And I want to stress that you know, we're trying to move this package along. That doesn't mean that we've got everything completely right and completely done. We continue to get comments. Um, and that's a good thing. So we're working to get comments and, and uh, accept them. And we think as we go out and talk to some specific groups, um, and I'd be happy to come out and, and talk to whoever down here as well about what's in the package. Um, and I'd like to bring along a, a Smart, a lot of smart people with me who uh, work in the division and in the department who can answer questions on different topics. So I don't usually come by myself. Um, but we can do that and we'll take those comments. And I don't know that we'll be making any changes prior to submitting it to ORR. I'm not really sure. It depends on what kind of comments we get. Um, because I don't want to have too many versions of the, we're on version 3 right now. I don't want to have too many more versions floating out there. But be assured when we make the comprehensive package available, even just to stakeholders, we are also going to be making available the responsiveness document from versions one and versions two that were put up. So if folks have public comments on versions one and version two, those will be summarized as well as our responses. And those responses will say, you know, thank you, we changed something, or do we note it? Here's our response, we did change it. And should also be tied to specific sections of the rules to help people understand what and where changes were made. The intent of that is to help people, you know, understand that we, we did look at comments and we did either respond or, or not. We, we considered them. And that, I hope, will save people from making the same comments again. I mean, you, you can still make them again, but you don't have to go into the gory detail. You can just refer to the past comment if you still feel your comment is valid or was not addressed appropriately. So that's the point of all that. Um, when we have the comprehensive package ready, we will um, hope to post it on the web, and if we can do that, we'll have uh, a clean version. We'll also have a version that's got yellow highlights that will show what's new between version 2 and version 3. And if you want to see what's new between version, that's the rules that are out there now, and version 3, you can go to the ORR website when that gets published, and that does the straight gold version, which will have that difference. We're trying to cover some bases here. I hope uh, that works for you. But that's pretty much the status. 
questions or anything I can try to answer? You said that JCAR has the option to convene a session to accelerate the, um, the approval of the dioxane pool. Mm -hmm. oh, um, what, is there a reason for or not to do that, or do you have a sense of whether they're going to do that or not? So I suspect strongly that they will do that because that just um, expedites the process. Mm -hmm. They've already given us um, approval for the certifi expedited certification process, which is pretty unusual. Usually that takes like a month in and of itself, and they've told us they'll turn it around in a week. Good. So that is an indication to me that they're willing to move this thing. So again, I can't guarantee anything. That indication means that I suspect that they'll meet. Um, now, the thing is, of course, they're on summer break. I don't know exactly when they come back and how many meetings they have and when. I can see that it looks like their first meeting is scheduled during that time period on September 6th. Uh, those are legislative session days. I can't remember what days JCAR usually meets. Um, but, you know, sometime in mid-September, they could convene and vote to waive for 15 session days. Would it matter if DEQ asked them to do that, or is that not allowed? <laughs> or is it, um, we or ask, but, you know, it's um, much more effective if somebody else asks. I mean, we can ask. We always ask. We ask every time. <laughs> so they're used to that. They don't really care. Um, but what they look for, I think, primarily is for support of the package. So if they feel like the package is not controversial, then they're more likely to say, sure, we'll wait those 15 days. If they feel it is controversial and they want to make sure everybody's got plenty of time to weigh in, they will not wait those 15 days mm -hmm. because they want to give the legislators a chance to talk to their constituents and get back to them. So, so thinking about um, them waiting the 15 days and whether or not it's controversial, would uh, letters of support be helpful rather than necessarily as a comment in that public comment period? Um, or yeah, is that so just another thing you have to then respond to? Like, oh, which one? Six one half dozen the other? Yeah, you don't need to send them to the DEQ. You would send them to uh, your reps, your state reps and senators, and or you could send them directly to JCAR. Well, the list of JCAR is available on the web. I know Stamis, and Stamis is one of the chairs. There's also a house rep who I don't remember. Anybody knows that? I probably should, but I don't. They're new. They just, I mean, because they just flipped over. So I have not met with them since they have a new house rep um, and new house members. So the JCAR is a joint committee. So it's, um, I want to say it's four Senate, four house, or four rep at the freshman house. Good work to them. Yeah. So you said you're going to do some information sessions. Are any of these scheduled? Yeah. Nope. I'm working on scheduling them. So if there's something, you know, if there's a group that you want me to come down to even the card, we'd be happy to do that. What I do like to know is if there's any particular issues, because I said I bring all my friends with me, and I need to know which friends to bring. So if somebody's particularly interested in developmental, or if somebody's particularly interested in the toxicity number, or if somebody's particularly interested in exposure assumptions, or it could just be a general presentation to a lot of people, but it's, it's, it's staff intensive, and so. But we would like to have one down here in this area. What time frame are you looking at? Well, you know, to be honest, I think any time, as soon as we get these things out, I don't think it has to be during the official public comment period, because again, even though we can't take official comments on the record, we are very open to talking to people and getting informal comments even. So I'm happy to do that. Um, you know. And this would be for the comprehensive package, you're right? Right, for the comprehensive <coughs> package. And by then, the 140 would probably be through already. It, it depends. I mean, yeah. we can schedule some. Well, we can't because I'm busy, but potentially we could schedule something for next week, mm -hmm. you know, and then it won't be ready. But there's going to be a period of time. If the earliest that 140 is done is September 6th, right? Um, we've got that month. Well, not a month, I guess, is it? But we've got some period of time. A few weeks. Three weeks. To, or we could try and schedule something. Um, you know, I'm trying to meet with uh, stakeholders um, in general, and stakeholders in specific. I've asked to try and arrange something with the bankers, groups of bankers who people who finance transactions that have to do with cleanups. Um, I'm trying to meet with some of the, the big um, stakeholders, like you know the Dow, GM, whatever, all those folks. I'm just offering. Yeah. They don't have to take me up on it. But I'm trying to 
arrange my schedule so that I can be available. Um, and those, some of those folks have some very specific concerns. Yeah. Um, so that's going to be a little bit easier, but we also want to do some general information sessions. We will certainly be doing a general information session on the day of the public hearing, again, for the general, or for the comprehensive package. I don't know what date, date that's going to be. I can't guess until we finish up 140. But whatever date that is, you can bet we'll be doing the information session. You've got like a one pager that kind of summarizes the significant changes, like here's what we're doing with the algorithm, the child receptors, and you know. I do, but it's old, but that's a good, good comment. I should update that. I just think for a lay audience, sure. I mean, I sat through this, so I kind of have a better understanding, but I think the members of the public, just knowing that this is a really, a lot of this is a significant step forward. And yeah, that's a great idea. Like I said, we, we prepared one for the last version no, that came out, but we need to update it, so. Great. So you haven't had any comments about the 14D change? None have been received today. What happens? If at the minute. last minute somebody comments, does that slow the process down? Not necessarily. They just have to respond. We have to respond. So if I get 100 comments in the last hour, mm -hmm. that'll slow things down. If I get comments coming in starting tomorrow, we start working on those responses right away. You have a time limit to respond, right? We do not, oh. um, but we have a self-imposed time limit. We're giving ourselves one week to turn okay. that around. All right. In for example, in the comprehensive package where we got so many comments and there was clearly some issues that needed to be addressed, yeah. we just sort of stopped the process and now we're kind of going well, back. I'm thinking back to the first contested case when the permit was issued with a tighter discharge limit. And in the last week, Gelman or Paul at that point contested it. And the local government units couldn't respond fast enough. So SRSW, actually me, because they had to be an individual at that point, counter contested it. And then the first contested case, when, the, when, they, when they increased the discharge length, the volume, then that gave enough time for the county and the city to join in. I don't really see that. Yeah, this isn't a contested case. This I know, but a comment that the last minute part. Of sure, <coughs> the last minute it. part of it. That to say, expect the last minute comment. And again, I don't, I don't really expect the last minute comment because we've had this emergency roll up for a year. So I think if people have issues, they know by now. Yeah. We'll see. See how it goes. Just let me know the company operates. So out of curiosity, when like a chemical like dioxin or when they reduced the arsenic um, a few, probably 20 years ago now, but not quite that long, but um, do sites that were previously cleaned up and closed and then have levels, if the criteria is lower, and they have levels above that, do they go back then and have to reopen those? No, we do not go back. We don't have time. But everybody has two care responsibilities that are based on the current criteria. Now, if we know of a, let me, let me also be clear, if a BEA were to come across my desk for a site that was previously closed and would show levels that exceeding whatever the current levels are, yeah, we're looking into that. Okay. We're working on those. Or any other way that something would come across our desk that would flag something. We're not ignoring anything. We're not going to dig. Okay. We don't have any kind of phone system that says, these compounds were used at these industries at these levels, and I mean, we do not have that. Some people may wish we did, but we don't. So. And then there's a probably a smaller subset of sites for which the department's got a legally enforceable agreement with a party or parties, and there's some provisions in 201. We've talked about that in the context of Gelman, for example, that the um, clean criteria that are embodied in the legally enforceable agreement prevail unless. Um, the respondent to that agreement asks for use of the revised criteria. Typically, that happens when a number goes up. <laughs> <laughs> Certainly, uh, that's been part of the challenge when we've talked about a situation here where the number's going down. If Gelman were to ask for it, then we would definitely say yes. 
it, you know, if it doesn't ask for it, and as the community knows, we've been um, involved in discussions with them about amending the consent judgment, uh, and, but ultimately that would need the court's approval on a consent decree type of situation. So there's a number of sites throughout the state that we've got these legal enforcement agreements in place, so concentrations go down. It's not a slam dunk that uh, that those criteria are going to be applied in those sites. So we'll look at those on a case by case basis. Typically, it might be it, it's going to be when uh, something comes to our attention that there's an unacceptable risk that needs to be revisited. So any other questions on the agenda item? All right, to the next. <laughs> so um, CARD recently submitted a request to the DEQ to do additional shallow groundwater investigations. Um, does the DEQ have a response to that, or do you plan to put one on hold? Mitch is going to with the So day. yeah, I'll, uh, I'll jump in on that one. We re did receive the, what was it couched as from the CARD? It was, Response to response to the five ten seventeen email. Okay, so um, as it relates to the representations that the DEQ hasn't done anything since the um, shallow groundwater investigation, we would respectfully point out that we have done additional work in the form of shallow. Well, it's sur sampling of surface water, that's an expression of shallow groundwater in other locations. And Dan can elaborate a little bit more than uh, Hamill. We've posted onto our website a summary. I think it's dated July 10th. Summary of activities corresponding to the end of 2016 and then to 2017. So we've summarized the, the number of places that we had sampled shallow water in the fall of 2016. Uh, we had also sampled a number of Allen Creek, and that was one, one thing Card wanted us to look into. That was in early, or I guess late winter, and Kevin and I think others were out there a couple weeks ago. Sampling <coughs> again, and all these uh, surface waters that we've sampled have been non-detected. 1,4 dioxane using a detection limit of one part per billion. As it relates to permanent well installation for sampling of shallow groundwater, uh, we did say at the October town hall meeting that in follow up to the investigation that Gelman performed using DEQ's work plan where two detections were noted of 1,4 dioxane and then two detections at separate locations of different volatiles. At one place it was chloroform and in another place it was 111 trichloroethane or TCA. Uh, we did say that we were going to be working with the county and the city and our other places within the DEQ to understand what other potential sources of contamination there might be for shallow groundwater. And that was when we were using the screening level for shallow groundwater for one point <coughs> and it was embodied in the October emergency rule of 29 parts per billion. As we said when we went out in, uh, and extended the emergency rule for the drinking water criterion for 1,4 dioxane in April of 2017, that the comments that we had received on the earlier rule package led us to conclude that the shallow groundwater screening level um, based on best available scientific information would be much higher said then it's going to be 1900 parts per billion and I would expect that that's the number that's going to be in the proposed package that Sue summarized a couple minutes ago. So based on that we don't see a <coughs> need to immediately go out and sample shallow groundwater and yet what the DEQ can say is uh, we're committed as we go forward to implement this remedy over the long haul that um, that pathway is going to be on our radar and we'll work with the liable party to make sure that it gets addressed. And then another thing related to public health concerns for shallow groundwater is uh, after the DEQ toxicologists get done supporting our efforts to get the package out for public comment, 
we're going to be reaching out to Rita, Dr. Rita Lack Caruso, to help better address the long standing question about wet basements from a vapor intrusion standpoint. So we certainly are aware of concerns of the community here, and I've had some conversations with our toxicologists to better understand whether the shallow groundwater screening level. 1900 let's talk about now because that's what we're going to propose is protective for a scenario where there's wet basements that we've heard from the community so after those discussions it became very apparent to me that it's going to be best to have toxicologists talking to toxicologists and since Rita is so engaged with the car and obviously a professor of toxicology at U of M that it makes sense for her to have some conversations with our folks to better understand the question so that we can better answer it um, once and for all. Whether 1900 is protective for the volatilization in your air pathway or not. So I expect you know, Chris Flago or Shane Morrison, another of our PhD toxicologists, to be reaching out to Rita after we get our proposed rules out there to further have those discussions. Yes, yeah, so I'll you, did I understand? So what you're saying is that those two aspects, the shallow groundwater and the volatation issue, were in the comprehensive package. Is the 1900 the yes. for 1,4 dioxane, I think, will be it's the proposed number right. for shallow groundwater yeah. for the 1,4 dioxane as a substance, right? Have you thought about looking at shallow groundwater at the core site? confidentiality stuff nope. so we, we can we can say that uh, you know we brought that uh, that same question up to gentlemen well I don't know if we can even say that yeah <laughs> I, I, think, I think we should <laughs> they are, say but they they have conducted a uh, investigation on you know in their in the area of their property we have been told that that investigation, we will be getting information this fall concerning that investigation, and we will evaluate whether information that uh, from questions, uh, can, whether that investigation contains information uh, and answers any of the questions we may have on the, about the property itself. And based upon that evaluation of, of that information that they give us, we will then move forward with any questions or any concerns on our part. Does that have to do with the property splits? Uh, no. You I don't mean know. like the, the prop, that type of thing? You're talking about real estate transaction? DEA they split their the parcel process? into six parcels. And there was a BEA that was done as part of that that looked at some, a few handful Yeah, the, the BEA had its, own, had, had its own, uh, uh, what I'll call BEA sampling, uh, minimal sampling on soils and shallow soils, I believe. And uh, no, this is, uh, again, uh, by, uh, this is information that we were told that they are uh, compiling and- uh, Separate from the split? Yes. Yes. My understanding is yes. The BEA came in prior to prior to this initiation when they told us about uh, they're going to be looking at uh, uh, conditions on the property in and around the property itself. Yeah, it's kind of late for the splits because in the split, the one that's public anyway, the BEA samples that I'm showing on the screen here, none of those locations are where the highest ever concentrations in the soils were. None of them. You're right, and that's what I'm saying. They have gone uh, post post that sampling. After that sampling, they have identified, uh, told us that they are doing additional sampling, and uh, we will be getting information this fall. At least that's what the verbal promise had been 
uh, for uh, once they compile that. Do you know if they initiate that on their own? Pass that right, right, can't they? Yeah. Do you know if they initiate that on their own or if it was from the people who bought the parcel splits? I can't answer. Oh, yeah. All I, I guess I would say there, Roger, is um, we know Yelman did a per, had a permit application to work in some wetlands over on their former property. I frankly, I can't That's a different tell you. thing, though. That's a different thing than yeah, the, what I'm talking about. Well, but you talked about property splits, so I... No, the property splits are their original parcel here. So, um, as... It's now it's six parts. Real one, estate two, transactions three, four, five, work, given environmental due diligence, prospective owners and operators of property do phase one and phase two environmental assessments, uh, where appropriate phase two environmental assessments to understand the environmental conditions of property at the time they take possession so that they can understand A, if there's um, so you're saying if the due diligence or due care obligations. You're saying that maybe the liability for cleanup might have passed to the new owner? I'm not saying that at all. You <laughs> said they had to do due diligence. <laughs> well, not, okay, maybe I better ask you to clarify your question. What, what questions? Who has the there? liability to clean up these parcels that are split? Gelman has liability to perform the remedy that's a body of the consent judgment and if we modify the consent judgment they'll have the liability. Even if they don't own the parcel anymore? That's correct. Okay, good. I should, I don't know if I should defer to my attorney, but he's, <laughs> don't yeah, let me know if I'm getting to you. not misstated, so you've, so you've not misstated the law. <laughs> Any other questions or comments? Quick question, Mitch, have you gotten any of the data that they are talking about from the site? I think not. Um, He's right. We've got nothing from them yet. For the for the soil sampling. For the for the vapor intrusion. Anything related to the permits that they sweat they got from the county to do investigation, geoprobing and uh, and from the township. The county, the county, county, township, and DEQ. Well, the county issues a permit for all the wells that went in, and you, the township issued a permit to work in the wet and to put it in the corduroy. Were, the uh, were these permanent wells? No, no. No. So they were like the RL wells that were done down there in West Park? They were just soil mm -hmm. They just went down and took a sample, pulled it out. Yeah. Did whatever they did. Yeah, and then, really fast. And then filled the hole in something. So. Mm -hmm. Go down through the clay layers. If you Google the Gelman site, the recent photo that shows up in Google shows the Cordia yeah, roads where they all sampled. Yeah. So you can see where they went to go and collect samples. Yeah, we just don't have the data for that. Correct. We know what happened. We, ex as Dan said, we expect to get the data and we expect to share that with the public, just like we do with all the other data. Yeah. What was it? When did that happen? April. Okay, so here we are in what? August. Some of it's still on They also promised that if they would have it this fall, is the description that we got. Okay. They did not give a month, a date. They said uh, this fall after they compile all the information and gather all the information. So sometime before December 20th. Yeah. <laughs> okay. What was the site? Why is it the 20th and not the 31st? Yeah. Oh, because the fall is the fall. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. Okay. <laughs> Okay. So the next item, Jen, I don't any other updates that you might have. Yeah, I have uh, a couple of things. Um, we, uh, and Jenny, you please uh, chime in here because you're the one that physically collected the samples. Residential well sampling, we have, have we, uh, I think we've completed the 2017 uh, sampling of 54. Do you have a couple left? I, I wasn't quite sure on that one, Jenny. No, we're all done. Okay, there, all the samples, there were 54 proposed uh, samples. Some of those some of those locations, 54 locations, some of them are collected twice a year. I have posted uh, on the webpage uh, January through April data. As soon as I get the full year, as soon as we get them all, I get it and I punch it out of uh, our, uh, our uh, lab, uh, lab database. I will post the whole year 
uh, for 2017. We've already initiated the process of proposing uh, uh, what what we're gonna, what residential wells we are going to sample for 2018. Uh, it, right now, what what we normally do is just regurgitate the year before. So there's currently 54 proposed locations. Jenny and I have uh, already started the dialogue. Uh, we will be meeting uh, probably within the next week to discuss uh, additions or reductions in that number. It will be additions. We are have already discussed adding uh, uh, the Lakeview uh, Road wells and the Rose Drive wells. Again, we had identified previously to the card that we will uh, take a look at those locations every other year. So it will be two years. Uh, so we most likely will will uh, add those uh, locations back in to get a buy uh, every two year uh, sampling results. We may also then uh, reduce the current proposed 54, uh, reduce some of those locations or, or swap locations there to every two years. Again, we uh, started that dialogue and haven't completed that. I anticipate completing that before the you know, by September 1st so we can submit that and, and then get the and then the county can get, uh, we can uh, authorize the county to uh, uh, to sample those wells in 2018. Um, let's see. Uh, as far as surface water sampling, I think Mitch very briefly has identified uh, that we have done some additional sampling this year in the spring. We went back, uh, Kevin, again, being, being my legs, so uh, if I can do it. Kevin and uh, Ray, Ray uh, in our office did some sampling again. We went back to some of the same locations, uh, the uh, 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 Allen Creek and First and Second Sister Lake. Uh, we had said that we would do that a couple times in the year to get some type of seasonal variation to see if a seasonal variation meant anything. Uh, in uh, you know, we did it in the spring when it was high water, and uh, we did it here a couple weeks ago when it was uh, low low water or less, uh, less than, again, as Mitch said, we got no uh, no positive detections in any of the surface waters. Our plans still are to do some additional uh, surface water sampling, a third sister lake, some of the Smith Pond, the Honey uh, Honey Creek, uh, and then uh, we also sampled this one a couple weeks ago, we also sampled the Honey Creek uh, Barton Pond confluence at the same location that, the, uh, that Gilman takes their uh, uh, sample daily sample uh, for their NPDES permit, and we uh, analyzed that for dioxane, uh, Dan, and uh, we got a non-detect there. Dan, for point of clarification, you mean Honey Creek here on River Confluence, right? Is that that's upstream of? Yeah, here on River. Pond. Okay, like all right, they thanks. Called part on yep. okay. And that's uh, sampling like, uh, they do for us. Yeah, as far as the the Burl, Burl Bay, same location. Yeah, the Burl, that. That's the NPDES. Yeah, the sampling they do for the city and. Uh, uh, we took it at that same location uh, and uh, sampled for dioxane. Now, again, that has been a request by the card group uh, for several years, so we've started that process. We will be going back there, uh, uh, you know, uh, during each year now and uh, gathering that sample. We know where it's at exactly, uh, so uh, we will, uh, whether whether it's in conjunction with with Gelman themselves or ourselves, we will be taking samples there. Uh, several times a year to uh, to keep uh, track of that. When I say Honey Creek too, uh, we had proposed to do some work uh, going up from the unnamed tributary up toward that uh, confluence up there toward the uh, Honey uh, uh, the River confluence and, and sampling in there too to get uh, just to get some uh, see if there's any uh, concentrations of dioxane in Honey Creek. We also are going to do the unnamed tributary again down downstream of where it discharges where the duck at Gelman discharges uh, and uh, in, in conjunction with maybe some sampling of monitoring wells uh, in that area uh, where the artesian well in that area where the artesian wells are where, where that you know where that type of thing and all when we're sampling those wells we go ahead and get a uh, a main tributary uh, uh, sample uh, there too so we will uh, excuse me Dan Dan, yeah. so when you sample the artesian, yeah. around the artesian wells, are you going to do a, like a upstream a little bit from where the artesian wells been, and then downstream to see what effect 
the artesian we, uh, wells we have? have Roger Cooper, I haven't, uh, I haven't come up with a sampling plan for that specifically yet. Uh, please send an email, I mean, make a suggestion. Yeah, that's what I suggest. That's, that's a good idea. Uh, you know, why don't you put it, uh, make a suggestion of, uh, in that sampling, I was going to identify uh, where the artesians, and then what is that, 41, whatever wells that are, that are in that area. Kind of, uh, kind of there, uh, we, can, we can do that uh, yeah. uh, as, as uh, you know, as a collection of information. I think that's a good, good idea, so. Uh, yeah, you know, there's only, uh, they only sample one of their three artesian wells in the last many years. Right. Yeah. Are you going to occasionally sample the other two artesian wells as well? Uh, I don't, I have to go back. I have not done that in my tenure yet, so that's one of, that's a good suggestion. <coughs> Thanks. So, uh, that's, uh, that's, what, that's what's currently planned. Again, like I said, Jenny and I will get together and come up with a final list of residential wells for 2018 uh, in, the, uh, in the next couple of weeks. Uh, we are, though, thinking of uh, doing Lakeview uh, Drive area and the Rose Drive area to the north there, uh, you know, because we've identified we'd like to get information every, couple, every two years. But this is money that these samples are being paid for by taxpayers, right? Yes. This is, uh, this is the, yes, this is the uh, yearly funding we get for uh, residential well sampling that we've been doing uh, since it, you know, since, uh, you know, way before my time. So yes, it is uh, public money right now. Right, you could argue up until a point that some of it's, um, was covered under that five hundred thousand dollar settlement in twenty fourteen. There was some past costs, some future costs. But we didn't put that into a Gelman specific account. It's not part of the well. Some of it's part of the new seven hundred thousand dollar. Right? Um, I don't know. Yeah. I don't know the accounting whether which part it comes out of and whether it can come out of that yet. Or you know, I don't know if it can be transferred that way. That's something that we could look into. But yeah, because that's something that a lot of people are concerned about is spending taxpayer money on sampling that the company should be doing. And something you can't. Again, as part of the, just realize as part of their uh, sampling, uh, uh, monitoring wells, what I'll call monitoring wells, they also sample uh, selected. Uh, water supply wells and uh, under their, you know, analyze it in their lab. So uh, they are doing some of it. Do you, do you get those results? Yeah, yeah they, they, they're posted. When we get a monthly, if they sampled uh, stuff uh, monthly, you know, uh, uh, whenever they, whatever their schedule is, uh, and I get that, that's posted. So you get all of their samples like that? Yeah. No, I'm saying in the well, I'm just based based on past history. Like there, there were samples done in the '95 database that aren't in the current database that were private wells sampled by the company. Well, I, well, I so I don't know if they still do that if they just drop off some of the private wells because the private well homeowner doesn't want it to be public or something. Uh, I can't, you know, I'd have to, I haven't, I haven't checked in detail. Well, you might not know. You might not even see. Right. <laughs> but I, you know, what we get is we get it on their electronic, uh, you know, right. the monthly uh, database. But we also get a electronic copy of the letters that they send out. When they sample a water supply well at a certain address, they will send the, uh, the owners and the, and the, uh, and the uh, residents of that, that address oh. a letter identifying what, what they found. So you have a folder of all those too, right? Yeah. Uh, now, right now, it, it, it's electronic because it's, it's volume, it's a lot, a lot of that rather than paper. But you keep but those. Yes, you keep the electronic copy of those. Yes, I do. Okay, good. All right. Any other DEQ updates? Uh, no, that, that's pretty much all I had on, uh, on what uh, the day-to-day -day operations.
Still on to agenda item number four, Roger, you have a presentation? Yeah, I've got uh, a couple that I originally built as short presentations. And when I, uh, <laughs> <laughs> when I did my podcast, <laughs> <laughs> I did my podcast and, and did the video of it, they turned out to be longer. So I'm going to go through as quickly as I can and make it maybe seven minutes long or something like that. So this is a 3D rendering of the plumes that Google Earth used in 2016. And it's just a close up view. We take, we take away the 3D, this is the 2D version so we can zoom in on certain wells. Here's a, a hit that was done on NW11S. That's probably a mistake. Uh, probably should have been 120. Here's another one that uh, So wait a minute, I gotta go back. I'm it. So when you take away that, this is what the graph really looks like if you change the scale. Similarly here, here's one that uh, is still in the database. It's definitely a mistake. We pointed it out before. It's in the 1995 database. It shows 150, but somehow when they transferred it, it's 1550. So that, that misleads people to think, oh, you got this all the way down to this level. No. Uh, it wasn't ever that high. This is what it really looks like. Then we can look at TW14. Here's a really high one, 21,000 parts per billion. Well, it turns out that wasn't a reading from the well. That was a reading during the boring. And not even at the same elevation. It's from a deeper, ele deeper elevation. But it's there in the database. It's not only in, it, it's in, DEQ's current database that supposedly is a complete set of all the data. This is what it would look like if you take away that 21,000. Well, that looks pretty good. Like, like, they removed all this dioxane and now everything's fine in that area. Except when you look nearby, 50 feet away at TW17, this is what's happening. It's going back up 50 feet away. Well, of course, TW17 is at a different elevation, much deeper. So maybe that's normal. So let's look at the two side by side. Here we go. On the left is TW14. On the right is TW17. They're only 50 feet apart, five foot difference in elevation. If you scroll down, here's the well screened area for TW14. So they put the screen in there, even though Several feet deeper, there was 21,000 parts per billion. They didn't cite it where the highest concentration was. But they purged for two years from TW14 until TW17 was installed. And if you look at what happened on TW17 in those same relative areas, 12,000 parts per billion and 43,000 parts per billion. No screened areas in these in TW17. So as far as we know, those concentrations could still be there. You can't, you can't go by what's in TW14 nearby because that's all the way down to like 2,000 or something by two years later. So this is what we're up against in terms of really understanding reality what's going on. And soon this is mostly for your benefit because I don't think you really understand the nature of dioxide and groundwater. It's really nasty because it's fully miscible, goes wherever water goes. It's so we don't know if these high levels, even the 21,000 or the 43,000 are still there. If we go down to TW17, the thing, strange thing about that is they got two screened levels. Very unusual, especially for a purge well. So when they're purging, are they purging from this shallower one or are they purging from the deeper one? So when you take a reading from TW17, you don't know which layer you're sampling. As far as we know, this is in the same borehole, same pipe. So TW17, after the well was installed, those levels are suspect. <laughs> During the boring, we can trust that those are pretty good because you know it's a one-time sample on those. The other thing that's strange is that during the boring of TW14, 
they had grout in samples a few times. So they didn't get a good reading at these deeper levels. In TW17, they did get some good readings. So that's an example of what's going on elsewhere, except you know, we don't have other wells nearby like that that we can compare to very often. So I'm going to skip through some of these others. There's a bunch of abrupt drops, and when you change the scale on that, there was a drop, but then it bounces back up and down. Other locations. So there's, even though there's a lot of dioxin not there anymore, we don't know if it was purged, or if it meant the dioxin just migrated somewhere else. There might not be wells nearby to detect that at that elevation. This one, this one's uh, interesting because it's on the northernmost part of the core, and it's been going up and down ever since the cleanup started. So this is maybe more indicative of what's really going on with the dioxin moving, and we don't know where it's moving to. There's a same thing on a different scale, so you can see the dramatic changes up and down. So these waves of dioxin are moving through certain areas. This one's particularly troubling. This is the uh, MW5D right in their core area. As late as 2012, it had 102,000 parts per billion, which is two thirds of what it was just before the cleanup began. So if you use this well as an indication of the cleanup, the cleanup was only one third done. What are the dates on there? Uh, 2012 to 2016 is the latest one. So just before the cleanup began, the cleanup really began in 93 at Evergreen. This was like 153,000. And then Either they didn't sample or they had really low readings for a while and I was back up and back down. It's probably, it may go back up again, they don't know. But it's still 14,000. Oh yeah, yeah, it's really hot. And this is, <coughs> this is only, if you look at this, the well depth's only 19 feet deep. Right. Yep. So your 1900 vapor intrusion might be an issue here. So there's no buildings on of course, there's no buildings over there, except for this one. And the one below up. I can't tell where I do. Well, you can look at that so. later. Okay. Um, Are they former, some of the former, former plan buildings? Well, that's closer there? to the only remaining parcel, that six parcel slip, that Gelman still owns. So it's like pond two, pond one, pond area. Uh, here's the others in the southwest area that have been going up and down. Again, sometimes a different scale to show what's going on. And then uh, we move up to the north a little bit here. Well, this one's troubling. This is the southernmost well uh, in the deep area. This is in the Saginaw Forest, U of M Saginaw Forest. It's near the caretaker's cabin. You can see it's going back up again. Over 300 parts per million in 2016. Now if we look at the well log for that, you can see that they screened it around 66 to 70 feet deep. Here are the dioxin concentrations in that area, so that's probably a good place to screen it. But then they went deeper. And they had all of these other readings, these double digit readings, in the deeper area in that same borehole. And there's no screens in this area for, look how deep, look how thick that is, 102. Like it's like 50 or 60 feet thick. No screens. And this is equivalent to the deep E unit aquifer. No sampling going on to the south. And the other thing wasn't drilled to bedrock. It could be even deeper. 
How year is that going, Ranch? That was pretty um, recent. 125. So it's yeah, pretty. I think that's pretty. We got a date here, 2010. So that's an unknown. Again, where this is, Third Sister Lake. Uh, I should have made a slide without this. There's there's township parcels down here across Liberty. Township wells that don't have access to city water. Just just across Liberty from that. So that's a concern. So here's some wells that are going up. up. Uh, this one is this one's kind of interesting. <coughs> NW1L. I'll talk about this one later. Because uh, look, they just stopped sampling. Well, what happened was they thought something was going on with that well. Uh, here's here are the actual samples. You see how it started out low, went up, oh, then went down, down. Enough. If the criteria had been okay for three years, we, if it's below, let's say 7.2, we don't have to sample it anymore. What would have happened if they quit sampling in 2005? Well, well, that's not the that's not the way it works. No, I'm just saying. No, that that's was not the way it at one time. So remember, they've got ten years post termination. Yeah. Or, okay, so you got ten years. Okay. So maybe it happened up here. If it's ten years, then they would have missed all of this. See what I'm saying? Yeah. Dioxane is pretty nasty stuff. Anyway, so they replaced that well with. MW1 replacement, and look at the values of that, even higher. Now they're, and if we superimpose the first one at the same scale, this is what's happening in that same area, same elevation. This is what's happening. This is, now MW1 is the first official monitoring well for the site. That was put in back in March of 1986. So all these years looks like, oh, you don't have to worry about that level. Then look, look what happens. So that dioxin is coming from somewhere. We don't know where. This is about, what did I say, 60 to 55 to 60 feet screen. This is the curious thing. The reason they said they wanted to replace that well, this is the comment they put in their data. MW1 is believed to have a leak in the casing due to increasing dioxane con concentration. Now you can take that two ways. One is, well, dioxane is so high in the in the casing that it's eating its way through and destroying the casing. No, that's not what they're probably saying. They're probably saying there's something happened to the casing higher up in the casing where there's a hole and dioxin is leaching in from the soils area and making its way down to the 60 feet. And they're sampling dioxin that's not really in that screen area. Which way do you think they're that note map? Did anybody else catch this, by the way? I don't remember. Why would they, did, I mean, did anybody say, well, why are you shutting down MW1 and making a replacement? Well, it's the rationale. You're asking working. people that weren't involved with those decisions. I know, but in thinking that, back now, I mean, this I, data is there. I do. All I can say for sure is the company was reporting that to us. There were discussions, but I can't remember the right. details of those discussions. So, well, we look at when uh, MW one replacement was put in, 2012. Now that we're talking about the time period when. The amount of information we're getting from the DQ about back channel communication has diminished. You know, we used to get a big fat packet of emails and discussions and before decisions were made. We don't get that anymore. All we get is like standard reports. So we don't know what back, what, what communication went on until we get something like this later on. Well, so we don't know what we should have. We, we know the, the results of it, you know, that, okay, there's a new well. We don't know why there was a new well. We can't, you know, all we have is that one line that says this is why there's a new well. So they were wrong either way. I mean, first of all, if dioxin really can go through the casing in 25 years that the well's been there, 
we've got problems all over the site. We have casings that rust over that period of time too. I mean, well, that's not that good that news to hear because as you, when I get to the end here, you'll see 25 years is nothing. Anyway, so that's a, that's a concern. What's going on there? It, it, I mean, it's bad enough that the concentrations are going up, but why they replace the well is still a mystery. <clears throat> and then if we go farther north, you know, we see increasing concentrations as we go toward Evergreen. And here's <coughs> one that's a big concern is uh, MW100 really shot up. And the nearby well, IW2, really shot up. Well, wait a minute. Really shot up and then it dropped back down. Why might that be? Well, IW2 is the second injection well for the Evergreen cleanup when they were trying to re-inject at Evergreen. Right. And the difference between this and a normal well <coughs> This is like 34, the, the screen length is uh, like 34 feet or 35 feet. So when they're sampling, you don't know if you're sampling where the highest concentration is or if you're sampling 20, 30 feet one way or the other. You know. and did the, did, is that one of the ones that former injection wells they compared yep. to a purge well to right here? <coughs> Well, I don't know if they've ever purged from this. I'd have to go look at that. I thought there was one of the IWs that they... Yeah, yeah the purging, purging of course, that you're bringing in water and all that right. stuff, right? But, so this one's, I mean, it's, it's good that we have MW100 next to it to know what's really happening, because if you're going by this, you're probably getting false results. How they drew this little oval of high concentration with only two wells at the very end, I don't know. I don't know how they did. Guess what? You know, maybe it goes back farther, maybe it's short, you know, we don't know. It, it, you know, it's a lot of guesswork there. And of course, we'll go up around DuPont Circle, and we have MW54D going up, 55 going up, 77 going up, and DuPont Circle itself. And then we go east, we got some other wells that are continuing to go up, away from the major part of the plume. And then if we go up here, we start to get a little concerned because we're halfway to the northern <coughs> prohibition zone. And this is going up to like three parts per billion in 2016. And then a little farther up, well, the, but actually this one might be a mistake because there was 2013, they had some faults. They said bleed over from, from the company that was doing the analysis. They never had been able to explain must have been pretty high concentrations to have bleed over with all their QA, QC. We don't know where those bleed over values came from. So this might be a bad reading. But if we look at the well log for this guy, this is indicative of another problem. Here's where they screened it. Here's like, what is that, uh, 94. So that's like 40 feet of wet area. They just put one well in. So there could be other things going on at these other elevations. Remember, this is the last monitoring well at the edge of the expanded prohibition zone. <coughs> there's a D, there's a deep one, that was a shell. Here's the deep screened area way down here. And that's fine because it's right at the edge of the dry area and you know it's good to be sampling that deep. What they missed was this intermediate one. It's a wet layer. And what's significant about this is it's about the same elevation as 465 DuPont and the other monitor wells around it. No screen here, not screen. They should have had a MW123I here. And then we go to the west. This is uh, 129D, the north and west, I should say. Again, solid hits the last couple of years, even to this year. Um, and again, this one, if we look at the well lock, this is the, uh, this is all wet area. This is where they chose to screen it. Again, look how, how thick that layer is. And they just chose right in the middle. Maybe it would have been more prudent to have two or three screens.
three areas in here because this is a very important monitoring well at the edge of the prohibition zone. Dioxide could be slipping through this more gravelly layer underneath that and not be detected. So you got one, maybe two parts per billion up here. We don't know what's going on down here. There's no screen in that area. And then finally, 121B, this is the last one to the west, two parts per billion. Anyway, so that's what we're up against. We've got this big plume. Um, these are the township wells or properties. They could have wells in the area for Sio Township and Ann Arbor Township. And if we pan back, we see this is the city of Ann Arbor. So these three jurisdictions are all affected by this huge 1,4 dioxin contamination. And it's going to happen for a long, long time. This is slide Larry Lemke provided in one of our car meetings. Did a couple stochastic analysis modeling. Average time to travel from Wagner Road east to the river 74 years to 351 years. He didn't have enough modeling to go other directions. So this is much longer than the DQ's 30, 32 year projection into the future. This is a that, that projection is sort of so everybody knows. I understand you're talking about financial assurance. It, among other things, okay, like so how long is somebody going to live in the area? Let's talk about, oh, 32 years is the criteria, okay. Right. You know, it's no longer a 70 year lifetime, it's a 32 year lifetime. Okay. So here are all the maximum readings per year for all of the, every, all the readings today in the current quote, official database. So we've had all of these, and this is a log scale by the way, so you have to, think these are really high, these are really low, and then you got moderate ones in between. Now if we sh shrink that down and say, can all of these values here get below 7.2 in 35 years? I don't think so. I just don't think so. We have to look much farther out than that. And here's what's happened in terms of the dioxin. You have 20 years of dioxin, 850,000 pounds. Um, in 1990, they estimated about 64,000 pounds left. They had to up that to 80,000 pounds, around 2,000 something. At the end of 2015, they had already removed 111,000 pounds. More dioxin, they said, was down there, and they haven't. This is something I've been asking for anyway every year is a, a mass balance so we know how much tax is left. And you can look at different sub areas and say if they're doing a good job or not. And they can do that. It's not that hard to do that kind of analysis. Now, if we just project that out about 30 years, which is what your settlement was, your, you know, when they had this spreadsheet that says this is what's going to happen, and we're going to reduce the you know what I'm talking about, the, the spreadsheet that is part of that, so. You're talking about financial insurance. Right, right, right. right. This is, they said it's going to be another 30 years, about $30 million. So they, they're removing about, if they can maintain 1,000 pounds per year, which is they've been doing lately, that's only going to remove 25,000 more pounds in that time period. How many here think 25,000 pounds dioxin removes, it's going to get this down to this level in that time period. I certainly don't. Anyway, so that's what we're up against there. I'm going to do that too. More than seven minutes. <laughs> more than seven minutes. It's probably more, when I did it, it was like 17 months, so I think I might have <coughs> at least got close to that. So just for clarification on the financial insurance mechanism, which I would hope we all agree was a good improvement that the state had from the 2011 consent judgment application. That the company to submit through, what the heck is it? That's a letter of credit now. That's what we use on yeah. it. Uh, so it's a mechanism where the state can step in right. and they get, the company's got a requirement to um, provide periodic updates, I think it's at every five years, or and we can request them more frequently. So it's a rolling 
but the time frame that doesn't just go away at the end of 30 years but I got 30 years from the spreadsheet yeah. that accompanied that when it's really probably a hundred years yeah there's so nothing in the consent judgment so I'd like to see some assurance from the, from the, the DQ that this is really you're really looking at this on a long-term basis that's that's what I'm saying there. well we're definitely looking at it on a long-term basis that's why we got the provision for the financial assurance mechanism required to be updated at some frequency with right, no right. end date on that so right. it doesn't go away it, it's always good to reiterate that yes anyway so the other thing I want to talk about is the pound circle 465 pound circle this is a this is a one of the early cross sections of what's going on in the pound circle except 465 DuPont circle elevation was wrong according to the database. They drew the elevation wrong. It was they said it was like 940. The top? No, it's not 940. It's about 930. Plus, they're about five feet off on the representation of the depth. If you correct for that, this is what it should look like. And this happened over and over again without correction. All these other cross sections that they provided were wrong. Now, if they used their own cross sections to cite these other wells nearby, the depth of them, those wells could be about 14 or 15 feet too high, screen too high to catch the DAX and it's moving through 465 DuPont. Also on this one, superimpose this later well, 121D, to show here are the wet layers according to this later um, cross section, this later uh, well water, that would be in line with these other wells between uh, 465 DuPont out to Dexter Road. So their representation of this being narrowed down here, there's a reason they showed dotted lines because they really didn't know. It's actually gotten wider <coughs> as you go more west. And if you look at the elevation, this is the corrected elevation for 465 DuPont. This, you know, this is following like up top of the lower layer. This could slip by. 121D to the west without being detected. Remember what I said about this not being screened? The only screened in the middle of this well area. There had been a, a, a D2 MW21 D2 that maybe you'd feel better about what's going on here. So there could be a layer here that's not being sampled. Here's some other ones where I had to superimpose 465 DuPont in the, uh, they chose not to characterize 465 DuPont for several years after this. I don't know why. If they if they used their old data, that's what it would look like. They used corrected data, that's what it would look, look like. And again, you can see here, This is probably more accurate of what's going on than this original one. That this this aquifer widens, it's it's thicker as you go to the west. It doesn't narrow down as they show here under. This is from 2008, the last time they did a characterization on the cross section with the 465 deposit. This is important because if they had cited 54 or 55 based on their, their cross-section diagrams, this corrected one shows where the screen level really is for 465 DuPont. It's not up here where they thought it was. It's down here. 
The other thing, if you look closely at MW54D, there is a clay silt layer here. We don't know how far it extends. It might extend out to here. So dioxane moving through here, if it's going to the north, could slip by underneath this screened elevation. So your double digit concentrations you see that MW54D might be, or might not tell what's really going on. You know, you had up to 2,000, 1,600 parts per billion here that could be slipping by to the north. But the other thing that's startling is that none of these were drilled to bedrock. None of these wells were drilled to bedrock. So this bedrock representation here is all guesswork. This one was, except we're not sure this was really bedrock. It just said refusal or something like that. There's no actual shale representation. Of it. So there could be even lower, deeper contaminant, deep, deeper aquifers even below these guys. And if you're talking about 100 years out, these probably should be considered. I mean, the sooner the better. So, again, here's a close up. The, this is what MW54D's well log looks like. It's, it's drawn very thin there, but we don't know if it widens out as it gets closer to 465 to really know. So here's the official database, and it's at both the DQ's version and the company's version. And the company's version that was sent temporarily in 2011 that they since cut the, the state off from. This is what they supposedly have for 465 Dupont. And yet, it did match up with all of their cross sections. Very much of a concern. One other thing how did all that dioxin get up to 465 Dupont without being detected? Well, it turns out it was detected. Here's a cross section that was done back in 2007. You know, it goes from Wagner Road here to Ferry Drive, Ferry Street, and then it does a little jog over here. But we're more concerned about this area. If you look closely at this, and I did finally look close the other day, what's in the red square, red rectangles here, are data that are not in the current database. They're not in the 2011 company database. They're only from the 1995 Gelman database that I asked for and got and passed on to the DQ back in those days. So somehow they've got a database that we're not seeing. This is coming from somewhere, from the company, their consultant or wherever. So this is an ongoing problem that there's a mismatch between the data that we have and the data that they're using in their analyses and their projections. And that's just unacceptable. Everybody should be using the same reliable, up-to-date, validated database. And I've been pointing this out year after year after year, but this is, had this been known, and by the way, this, this isn't the highest level. You know, if they have the data, they don't even have the latest 1995 data. It was really up to like 5,900. So there's really high concentrations that are moving through the Westover area that have made its way out to Evergreen. And we don't know how it made it there. There's hardly any sampling at the right elevations in those high areas. And that might be able to deliver. One more thing. Sorry. Yeah, I know you do. Check in later. So this is one of the posts on our SRSW website. These are the samples 
from Prairie Street from the 1995 data that are no, that are not in uh, the current database. Paul had four of these. Oops, I'm gonna go make this up there. I'm sorry. Yes. Okay. So over here, start over. All right. So um, just scroll down. Of the almost 2,800 sampling records um, from the 1995 database that are no longer in the current database, these are the ones that are on Ferry Street in that same area I was just pointing out here. Uh, Gelman has a handful of those represented in this chart. We don't know if they have the rest. Also want to point out that So this is uh, yeah. So this is a uh, um, Gelman's own flow for the deep uh, for, for the aquifer that's making its way out to here. And then we have a later version of that here. You might have missed this one because on later ones they don't show these this last line, they only show it over here. So if you look at DuPont Circle, these flow lines seem to indicate that this is going to go north or northwest. And probably beyond the prohibition zone. So all of those things I pointed out earlier, this is another reason to be concerned. Well, you can drill another well nearby. You can't drill. I just 
matter because the cost, you know, bring the cost down. Which they've done several times. I mean, you can look at a lot of the nasty there, like right next to each other. Okay, and but if, the second question is: um, Has anybody? Are you saying that Gelman is not <coughs> is not sharing information from their database anymore since 2011? No. What I'm saying is that. Well, no, well, that's kind of true. And what happened was, uh, one of our card meetings around 2000, early 2011, or whatever, said what happened to mention all oh, the companies transferring to a different database. And she characterized it as being hosted at Wayne State. Oh, well, that's interesting. How long has this been going on? It was like a year and a half. And we just found out about it. Well, I asked her to get a copy of it snapshot of it and she did and I compared the, the new 2011 database with the old existing database and there were hundreds of anomalies some of them we could explain away as being sample uh, I forget what the term is no it's just you know the, the routine QC QA type samples but there were other ones where we had samples before, they're no longer there. There's some instances where there are samples there now that weren't there before. And more curious, there were some samples there with the same date and time and a different person mm -hmm. doing Okay, well, how can you do that? Is somebody typing these in again? You don't just change data as you move it from one place to another. I mean, I've done conversions overnight on financial system with balance to the penny. Did anybody do a QAQC on their data conversion? We couldn't even. So I raised these issues and then sent it to the DQ. And then a few months later, they had sent, verified it, and found maybe some other things and sent a letter to the company uh, saying, please explain. What did they say? Please explain this. They said, give us a schedule when you're going to explain this. And the response was a nasty letter from the Gelman, or Paul the lawyer, saying, well, basically, screw you. You know, we're we're giving up our database. We let you read our database, and if you're actually going to look at it, and compare things, then we're going to cut you off from the database. And that was basically it. Okay, and that was when? They were 2011. <laughs> okay, my question. So my question is, have you? But gone? what they do is the so the base we know has got anomalies. Okay. Uh, the DQ did not use the new base. They're still using the old base, which is like why that 21,000 was still. How old? Well, everything up that the company provided before that, which again is not complete. Uh, so what the company does now is they send a summary every month that Dan Hamill has to reconstitute into their the DQ's existing database and then share with the public. But we know that that <coughs> base amount in the the UK's existing database has mistakes or differences anyway from what the company's was. We know that the company has data that's showing up on their cross sections and maps and things like that that are not in their 2011 database, nor in the DQ's database. So it's like things are diverging in terms of data. So they've got data that you that they're not giving to you. And they're not giving. They're not sharing with. Well, they're sharing it in a form, but not, you know, like, okay, you have to look at this cross-section, then you can pull it off of there, but then again, that's not all the data. So has anybody gone back to the court and asked the court to order them to release the data with a deadline and a penalty if they don't? I'm not a, I'm not a party to the case. And if not, I can, not? We, I can suggest that <coughs> to the DQ and to the other parties, but I don't know if anybody's actually raised that in court. Well, what do you think it's worth raising? No, it, absolutely worth raising. I mean, certainly in 2011, it was an issue. It should have been raised right then. So uh, I just have a question. So, I mean, clearly there's issues with data. You know, right? yeah. yeah. But I wonder, in the in the world of um, limited resources. Yeah, good enough for government work, right? No, that's not where I'm going with this. So I'm going okay. What I'm saying is, if you, it, it appears to me that you've done a lot of research, you've, you've made some 
I try to pull every all the information right. I have together in right. place and present it and hope that the decision makers do the right thing. So in terms of if you had all of the missing data or if you were able to um, uh, normalize or whatever it word is, cross-reference, mm -hmm. double check, 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 whatever you got in the grade, do you think the outcome would be different <coughs> in terms of what we know today? Well, certainly in terms of where to cite some of these wells. You know, we, we could be missing layers of dioxin because somebody's not paying attention. Or not enough people are paying attention, I should say. There's no, there's no unified paying attention, let's put it that way. So, and then the second part of my question is, again, in terms of the big picture, have you, and, you know, whatever the outcome from your research would be, or is now, have you prioritized Again, think about resources. Well, the first thing is, <coughs> what's the reality? So let's have a unified database that everybody can use, all the stakeholders can use the same database. We don't have that. I, I get that. That's the starting point. But and I've asked for that over and over and over again, and I that seems to happen. But you've got a lot of historic data here, and you've able to make some theory, together some theory. But I'm not the, I'm not the regulatory agency. I, I understand that. I should, awesome. I should not be the, I've been called out, like the, the, the letter the, the uh, government, the Paul Lawyer sent back, called me out in person saying, well, the only reason you want this data is for the public, i.e. Mr. Rail. Like nobody else is looking at the data. The DQ wasn't looking at the data. We Other people aren't looking at the data. <coughs> yeah, I don't think that's fair. When you let it drop. I mean, you know, the let, what, the eldest lawyers can say what they want. No, but the, what, what's your response to that letter from the from the lawyer? So where I was going with this was more of a in, in terms of the theories that you've put together, the information that you personally have been able to get from the data. Have you identified and prioritized the things that you would like to see happen? In terms of the big picture, all of these different things you pointed out. On circle issues, you pointed out, right. well, it's trying right. to call the right. numbers, you've got this, you've got that, you've got that, you've got right. theories. Right. So they should have done this, they should have got that, they should have right. gone over here, we should be sampling here. Right. It's a lot It's a lot of second guessing because. True, True. but you're actually very well versed in this. It's a lot of second guessing because CARD is not involved in the first guessing. I can't help that. I'm asking you. No, I'm saying that's what's happened. So we're, there's things, that are, there are decisions that are being made that didn't used to be like this. We used to be, we used to have input before final decisions were made. Now it seems like, okay, there's the, the things done behind closed doors, and here's how we're justifying it to the public. Final decisions are made by whom? Whoever is behind those closed doors. We're not... We're not at the table making the first guess. We're, we're, we're start making second guesses. So you're saying there are meetings occurring on the back, saying issue which should be public, but are private, and that we're not the public is not informed of. Well, decisions even if they're even if they're made in the past, at least we knew what the conversations were. We had copies of emails. We had copies of reports going back and forth more than we have now. Maybe there's just not that much reports going back. But before, we used to have a lot more detail on what was being discussed so we could weigh in in time to say, here's some information. You know, we understand the DQ is short staff. We have the citizens and the stakeholders, we have to kind of fill the void and do what we can to help with the decision making. But if we didn't have the opportunity to provide those kind of inputs before the decisions are made, then we can only complain about it later, say second guessing, you know, because we're not in the loop. That's what the problem is. So you have a wish list, this is what she's asking, and to prioritize the list. Should, you, is it written somewhere? I mean, if you had to, we man, have, we're God, and you could, or King, and you could say this should all be done. We've submitted under card in an SOSW. <coughs> lists of concerns to the DQ and for years now we you know every year or two we'll trot out another list of concerns and, and 
not much happens. Well, so, I mean, you asked earlier what we did if we got the, I think it was October, November 2011 call, letter from Caldwell, wherein we asked for them to explain the discrepancies, some of which we fact checked based on what you had sent to us. Um, so part of that, I, I don't have it all committed to memory, but I think it culminated with the submittal of a quality assurance project plan, QUAP, for sure, that's the acronym. Uh, because we had legitimate questions about how they were managing data, how they were sharing mm -hmm. the data. Mm -hmm. um, and after that, that 2013 glitch in several wells that showed two, three, seven parts per billion that didn't really happen, happened. So that's after 2011 quack. Well, How did that happen? I Why was the QAQC of the monitoring and data, you know, it's like they didn't notice it until they sent out the data. I mean, we had to, we all had to point that out to them that there's something wrong with the data. They didn't catch it. So what good is the quap if they're not following it? Well, I don't think we had the quap at that point. We well, it's two years later, yeah. we should have had it, right? Uh, took over that. With some additional negotiation and discussion with that. Um, so I and do we, but even after that, we still don't have the correct base data. So, I mean, that raises other questions about the database, and I know um, you, I, I can see where you're coming from, where you want all the historic data in the database, the company takes a different view of it. Well, the company, companies using the historic data that, that I have. Well, let me. Then you, I've given you I copies of. Part of the. And they're using it to say this is what happened in, you know, 2007 and 8. So I think part of So the we're, well, why, why are we are in 2017, we don't have a copy of that data. Well, you know, we don't have a copy of the data. You just showed it. But it's not a form you can do analysis with. So it's not. You're going to make. You're, you're going to go through all these things and try to find the all the missing data. Delivery device, and one of the things we worked on with the assistance from the Attorney General is the what requirements we have under law to get copies of the data delivery device. And the answer is we don't have requirements under law to get the data delivery device. We've got requirements under law to get the data. So we've got the data. So we need to change the law. <coughs> well, I'm not going to. This is the 21st century. I'm not going to argue that with you. I, What's I, a delivery device? Paper data. Excel. Can we negotiate? You have to scan it, OCR, 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 so Again, we have the data. No, 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 no. We don't have the database. We don't have the underlying database. We have whatever subsection. It sounds to me. We have whatever subsection of that data they've chosen to share in a particular format, right? And don't have a pro you, pro don't have the do program to make it operable. It sounds like is that right? I mean, well, there's no way to actually <coughs> the, the, manipulate. It's or just a matter of putting the data in or to model from that data anything. Data. So I know. Is that correct, or am I misunderstanding? I mean, We've got the question. data. We don't have the database. I mean, so right. I would agree with most of what Roger said in terms of the history of you know this so-called reconstituted database that Dan Hamill was on the phone. You came in late, but Dan was on the phone. Takes no, a spreadsheet that. Okay. Sorry. Okay. Sorry. Um, Dan takes a spreadsheet we get from the company with the data, <laughs> merges it with our historic database. It's not all inclusive. It doesn't have any every historic data point collected on this site that's been going on over 30 years. Um, and we'll another thing we agree with is we're, we're we the community DEQ is part of it at least for the sake of that discussion. Part of the community are going to be dealing with this issue for many many decades many. to come. Yes. EPA even yes. in response to the petition, you know, says. This is going to go on for decades to come. So, 
should or could legal changes be affected that require liable parties or others to submit data to uh, the state regulatory agency um, happen? Sure, you know, that would probably be helpful, but we don't have a legal requirement to dictate what form, nor does EPA in our discussions with them as they've gone about evaluating, uh, you know, uh, I think Jenny and, and company as they were doing research for the county commissioners on benefits of Superfund, <coughs> when they found out how much data is available on Superfund sites compared to what we have on our website and what we've got for the site, found out we're doing relatively well compared to some of the Superfund sites, but we don't have a legal requirement to dictate how they deliver data to us. But the court can make you deliver the data in real time. Judge can do it. Yes, and I don't care what unless you ask it, which is That's what we've been saying for quite as long as asked. I can remember. As long as I can it's remember. It's elementary. I mean, what's, I mean you what's may lose that. that. Yeah. But they're going to look unreasonable. I don't understand. That. I really do not understand. The well, you guys are all party now, right? Members. Diana is Card a chips now. Is Card a party? Card by itself is not a party. No, but individuals around the table. Card yeah, members. There are some of them around the right. table here. They're a part of it. So, the, where's that? Well, is there a representative from the Attorney General here today? Yeah. Okay. So why but I don't get to talk about <coughs> this case. Right. Yeah. What goes on with the negotiations. That's, that's, that's part of ground rules. There's, <laughs> oh. a, there's a tight <laughs> settlement agreement in place. None of us can talk Come about it. Mm -hmm. Yeah. But it's a public. But we want to. But we public. Well, it's not being. Yeah, but the issues <laughs> are not being right. public. Settlement negotiations <laughs> are in litigation are not. Are not the public thing. disclosure. So that's that's <coughs> the dilemma. That's with the our problem of the confidentiality agreement. Yeah, I'll try to understand this at some point. Okay, <laughs> I want to ask you something. Okay. A few minutes ago, when Roger was asking you, or somebody was making some comments, you said that. That's not how Gelman sees it. Um, okay, she's not even, she remembered. The discussion went on, but you were commenting how, that's not how Gelman sees it. It was about the data. We want, we want consistency with the data. The data isn't in usable form. And then you, someone said so, something to that effect, and you said, well, that's not how Gelman sees it. Here's one of the problems that I see. We want, a lot of the people at this table want the DEQ to be on our side. And it feels sometimes like you're on Gelman's side. You can see how they see it, but do you see how we see it? I mean, Absolutely. listen to my, my Moran. Well, I mean, I, there's yeah. frustration. I wasn't involved four or five years ago. I've tri I tried to understand more and more these last two years, one year. But I hear all this frustration from people who've been with this for years and years and years. And we want you to understand our perspective. I do and we do understand your frustration in some some cases share that frustration. I would say many cases share that frustration. And believe me, we do. Uh, but we also so understand where we're at. So so we're the department. We go to court. We do what we get. We didn't. We're not the judge. We didn't make that judgment. We can't. We we do our best. We're as frustrated as you are about many things. But you have to ask, and it sounds like the ask has not been made to the judge. Well, it's true that we have to ask. So I can't say it is or it isn't, but I also would say that my point was is that everybody around this table who is now an intervener, is the right word, intervener, yeah. has the opportunity to ask as well. So true. Get, with, get with the program here, everybody. <laughs> you know, we're, we're all in this together, yeah, to well, your point. Well, we, we are all in this together. Your frustration, you ask, you, you want us on a, your team. We are, you know, our focus is to protect public health, safety, welfare, and the environment. You've heard me say it before, but I've got to say it again. This, this Gelman site is a great case study in the evolution of issues of environmental law over the past 30 plus years. Devolution. <laughs> and I, I understand fully where you're coming from, Eric, right? Yes. Eric, I understand that. Um, as citizen Mitch and as regulator Mitch too. And yet, um, EQ doesn't make the laws, 
sometimes we have input on legislation that when it makes its way through the legislative process, either gets enacted into law when the governor signs it or not. So when that, after that process happens, we have to deal with the hand that we dealt. And I, I point out, you know, I, I think we're a victim of our own success because my office in particular has been transparent in how we describe this. When people say well, they want a better cleanup, after some of the court's decisions on this site, you know, it, a good part of the case study is we found out about groundwater contamination in the mid 80s, took the company to court after we were unsuccessful getting them to voluntarily clean the site up, were successful in getting a consent judgment that required the company to restore the aquifer to unrestricted use. Um, we sought to enforce that consent judgment on a couple cases that resulted in a 2000 order that required the company to do what they said they could do, i.e. achieve the objectives by 2005. That didn't happen. Locally elected judge reacted as we all know the history of how he reacted. And, and so when we say our job is to manage risks and sites of contamination rather than clean it up, it's because I can't be conscious represent to the members at this table or other member, community members that this is a cleanup in the context that a lay person would understand a cleanup. It's a risk management approach. I understand the frustration that you all have. And then, you know, from my citizen standpoint, I could say I share it, but you don't hire me uh, for that, you hire me to oversee and implement the laws. And we took, tried our luck in court. You guys can say it's bad lawyering. I, I understand that and respect it. We've got a different view. We've gone to court before. We've, we've demonstrated willingness and ability to go to court again. And we'll continue to do so. We've got to pick our battles. So we're going to continue to take that approach. Meanwhile, as it relates, you know, some of these things, the drinking water number, you know, again, we're all about making sure the public health is protected. Uh, ideally, that the environment is too. Um, and we're going to continue to focus on that as we continue to do our jobs the best we can in accordance with the, the hand that we've all been dealt. Uh, since you were talking about uh, past data, here's another example. And, and let, me, let me just address Kathy's last point. So I think the point, the comment I made, Kathy, about Gellman doesn't see it that way, it's, it probably goes right to what Roger's talking about. They, what they told us is, you know, they, they see it as an immaterial difference whether there's data in their database from 1988. I'm not saying we agree with that. Um, I think it does go to the questions that Sue was asking about if those data from Monitor Wall 30D from 1980, whatever, Roger, help me out here, the late 80s, 30D, if that, those were in the database, would that materially affect the outcome today? Or the, the well, here's an example of that. So these are copies of pages that were printed. So these are supply wells, Gullman's own supply wells. Now this is in milligrams per liter, so you have to multiply this by a thousand. So this would be 120 parts per billion. Mm -hmm. Their supply wells were in the D or the DE unit. This is the map that uh, again I had to put this in one layer. It was like five, four or five uh, different sheets, but you go over the land, this is what the plume looked like at one part of the day and back around 1990. This was the uh, cross-section diagram. The, the company, when Kim Davis was in charge of the cleanup, the 1995 October meeting at South Country Hall. Anybody else there besides me? I was. Were you there? So they had two sets of these. So after the meeting, I said, Kim, can I have one of the sets? So this is their foam board. Yeah. What I've done here is superimpose these supply wells on their 1985 cross-section diagram. 
So they were telling people, this is all we have to worry about. You know, there's a C3, it goes down to the D2. Yeah, there's a D0 that's going to go out. We have to watch out for that. They already knew there was something going on in the D2. <coughs> Did not tell people. Now, Kim Davis may not have known because somebody else was actually doing things behind the scenes to make this. <coughs> but had they had a central database, it would have popped up, right? So that's another example. Way back in 90, 1995, <coughs> just two years after I got involved. Had we had a database back then that was electronic, I would have probably gone in and looked at it and said, hey, what about these guys? 20 years ago. So I just want to bring it back and that we, there, yes, nothing, not nothing, but a lot of things were done wrong in the past. Or, you know, they continue to be wrong. Well, they're still wrong, okay, but we need to all work together to improve that <coughs> now and then to move forward with making sure it doesn't Sounds happen good. again. So it's a collective amongst everyone <coughs> prioritizing issues that we find, being open to communication, and I think that's the goal here is to, to stop being so angry about the past or at least use that to anger to learn and to fuel moving forward. I have another question. This case, the addition of the additional plaintiffs in the case, was uh, that uh, decision by Judge Connors was being appealed, wasn't it? And what's the status of that? The appeal was denied. Yeah, was denied. Oh, that's good thing. wow. That's big. Yeah, I'll point out another thing, too. Um, in 2002, other contamination besides dioxane was found in the deep aquifer at the Gelman site. These other things. Do you think it's from the same processes or is that unrelated? We think it's unrelated. Yeah. At the Gelman site. We had some baseline environmental assessment data from some other sites and some of these data. Um, I think we're, if I recall correctly, generated by Gelman at our request since we, they had monitor wells in the vicinity and, and follow up to those reports that we got. So, the Ann Arbor machine is one place that comes to mind, and that's a, you know, that comes to my mind because, again, we got um, a baseline environmental assessment on the former Ann Arbor machine property. So that property had transacted, we did some liability determination work and found um, that we, could, we would classify it as an orphan site. And I've got, we've got that in for a future funding need for when and if additional state funding resources become available to deal with orphan sites. Because we so that this, uh, this doesn't leakage from the deep well coming back up? Leakage from the deep well coming back up. The, the deep injection well coming back up. I for the deep. No one knows. Yeah, right? yeah I got, we've got no evidence. No, so yes, before or after. Yeah, we have a support for that completely. Yeah. Just, to, just to be, just so people well, know that there's. But, so again, there's another issue that you're raising, and I'm right. wondering how does this relate to all the other issues you've raised? I don't know. It, it, it is, but what, what, what we're really worried about here is the mistakes that have been made continue to be made. So there's a lot of doubt because things aren't done according to Hoyle or according to Roger. Okay, but. I'm not going there. I'm, I'm just innocently asking, Roger, innocently asking from all of your research that you've done, which is obviously quite extensive. You have a number of theories, you found a number of issues that make you uncomfortable and well documented. What's the priority for going forward? If someone were saying. Well, let's start with I'm, the database. Is that, is that really the highest priority? <coughs> I'm, I'm just asking. I'm not being cynical. I'm not trying to be. I, I'm would, not, I, I mean, that's the simplest, easiest thing to do. I would you say would, this time it is. I mean, we had a number in a list of five or so things that we've been pressing for a number of years ago. And one of them was for, oh, I don't know, approaching a decade, we couldn't get the Attorney General's office to attend or participate in any of these discussions so that the kind of presentation that you just saw would be available to them. Since Brian has been here, that's a different situation. 
Whether it's made a difference, I don't know, because uh, Ann Arbor Township's not a party to the litigation. Uh, so I can't evaluate that, but I very much appreciate and hope that there is a difference as a result of, of that kind of attention. And the two things that we had as our top priorities through that entire time was um, getting uh, the assignment uh, of an assistant AG to this um, enormous data set, you know, so that we could present what we had to present and, and say, you know, these are the issues we think. Brian, here's that. Um, the second thing was, again, as Roger said, to get a set of data that was meaningful uh, and, and sufficient to evaluate uh, the status quo and the future. And that really um, means a number of things. One, in terms of the methods of sampling that are being used and the reporting of the data and the availability of all of it to everybody. And the ability to understand and use the data in a way that doesn't take 90% of our time just to populate the database. So I think those are the two most important things. We take one of them off, and the other one is certainly probably the next highest level of concern. So, Roger, so we, we brought Sue down in the, the team. We've laid out a couple of these priorities. We have the board here that can vote, make a motion to vote. Sue's asking for direction. Why don't we officially give her direction? Yes. What about increasing the amount of pumping and treating? Trying to, I mean, that's my first priority, is getting the actual remedy going more than a third of what is mandated. I, I don't know why that's not happening, and that would, don't, that would be well, my but, first priority. It's but, already in the books. But you don't want to just do it really, no, you want to do it based on something else, the data. The data. <laughs> exactly. So I go back to my original question. I don't care about the data right now. You've got wells that they can pump all that stuff. You know it's there. Start pumping and then look at the data. But and you then might adjust. not be pumping from the right place. I don't care. Pump where you can pump right now. <laughs> Do it. You've got the pumps in, the in place. Line. Use them. Okay, back to my point. We are still a lot of work to, a um, lot, uh, lot of good work period. And recently, have done a lot of uh, been focused on making itself uh, an entity that uh, that others in the room frequently espouse, market, defend, whatever. Uh, and and I, for one, want to see that continue. So the directors asked the question: Can we answer it? And even if we have to complete it later, even if we're only going to give Sue two priorities out of what we think will be twenty, what would your First two be yours. Um, they're not mine, Roger. You're the guy. But you're a member of Card. I agree with yours. I, I I am only concerned about the debt. With so all due respect to, to everyone, is who interprets it once we get it. And I know Roger, you know this stuff, but I get nervous about <coughs> it. But yeah, yours. I, I guess where I'm coming from is you've identified a lot of things, not only missing data points, but also areas of concern. You've talked about the pool moving. We need to be concerned about this, you said several times, this and that. Mm -hmm. So, you know, I'm just trying to look at going forward, and I, I don't know how much difference in many of those concerns additional data or correction of historical data is going to make. I don't know. If, if you really think it's that much of a difference, I mean, don't think we don't want all the data, too. We do. So we're on the same page with it here. We really want it. Now, we've got constraints. We can't, we can't you know, get blood out of the stone. We're working our best to get this stuff. But given that there's, you know, limited resources and, and, and we need to focus our efforts, right? I'm just curious, and I'm not making any promises here, I'm not saying I can, I don't have a magic wand, but I'm just curious going back working with my team, going back and talking to the AG's office, working with legislators, it's always helpful to know, especially with someone with your background and insight here, what are the, is it more important to look at a certain site and see what's going on? Is it more important to put a 3D model together based on what data you have? Is it more important to address a, a pumping, you know, figure out where to put the wells to pump? What is, what is the most important thing that you see? And I don't really want to answer right now. I'm just suggesting that this might be something useful for you to think about because it would help me do my job. But you, you guys- All stakeholders you? should be working from the same central, reliable, up-to-date- Database. Trust okay. the database. Sounds like you're saying. Okay. If you can get that far, 
Uh, and I don't know that we steps. can, because it certainly has not been for lack of trying so I mean, that's just common <laughs> sense. You know, you got, you got, the, they're making claims without looking at total data. I might be doing the same thing. You know, because I don't have some of the data that we know they have. And it's, it's something's wrong with this picture when a, a citizen volunteer has the most complete database on the site. <laughs> should be unusual. This is not the way good government is supposed to work. Good government is supposed to be good government. You're supposed to now let things slide and okay, we'll give in to the responsible party. Wait, nobody has government. asked with the current judge, not any of the interveners or the DEQ, why can't we get the database as Gilman uh, takes the data? Right. Is, is that right? I think that's right. Yeah. yeah. And, the, and never have asked for it. The reason we have the 1995 database is because I asked for it. I sent a letter to Chuck, Chuck Gelman, and he sent a letter back saying, we'll provide you the database. Now, it took more than a year, it took Ken Davis in charge to actually deliver the database. And of course, Kim Davis didn't know that somebody in the company did not deliver all the data. So that's a problem within the company. All right, well, he so made a claim that, that we're going to resample all the wells in 1995 and provide a copy of the database. They never resampled all the wells. Mm -hmm. MW 3D never got resampled. Which so is, ones they get. says is so important. We have a new judge. You just noted right. before the new judge is day and night over the old judge, and if nobody asks, he's not going to make. He's not going to spontaneously issue a discovery order. So somebody's got to do it. Now there's all these new plaintiffs who are, thank goodness, have standing, and any one of them can make that discovery request to the court on a motion anytime. It'd right be now. better if it was done all by all the parties. It should, it, it, all well, the, all I, our don't, side parties. I, I, I don't know where the state stands. No, we've got a mute attorney general here, so I can't... Uh... Yeah, that's the other thing. <laughs> you can't say anything. <laughs> you can't say anything about the case. Could you at least ask a question once in a while? <laughs> I'm serious. I'm listening. Yeah, what's the problem? Is this how you go? Is this how negotiations happen with the company? You just sit there and listen to them, or do you actually say something? All right, it's three o'clock, so we need to wrap up our meeting. So, um, thank you all for coming. And next, four to meeting is scheduled for November seventh, which is Tuesday from ten to noon. We're going to change that, right? Well, that's say that's election day. I don't think we'll change it. Unless, There's is no there anybody who can't right here, come? Yeah. Okay. So is there any kind of motion on the table to give the DEQ set of priorities or that uh, the card recommends? Is that I'll, I'll yeah. have to do this. I don't think there's a motion, but I'm pretty sure there's going to be an agenda item. Yeah, exactly. Okay. We can do it that way. Yeah. That makes more sense. We can have discussion. I think there's a lot of agreement with what Roger's saying about the data. But it's also reasonable for us to move forward in a positive way and not rehash the past excessively. We just look forward to what we need, but yes. really this yes. legitimate um, requirement to properly evaluate the status of the uh, I have been looking back at our list of concerns and trying to aggregate those into an ongoing list and tally whether or not they've been addressed and processed or whatever. So that's that's in that's on my in my the ball is on my court on that, but uh, doing what I can. And I just want to put on the record the judge could also be requested to order the uh, or to order Gelman or whoever to pump up the limit. I believe but you may not be able to do that. Well, <laughs> I, okay, I don't know so how much we're gonna <laughs> adjourn it didn't stop. side conversations can continue. It, did, it didn't stop, it didn't stop Judge. Uh, Shelton from ruling without data. Thank you, Dan. I know. I know. That's right. I'm really thankful that the DQ is tightening the standard.
Oh, yeah. Take care, Dan. We'll be in touch. That has taken more than six years. Okay, Jenny. I'll give you a call. We're losing basically over 95. But at least we're on the right track. All right, sounds good. Mike. Mike. Sixteen and a half. Do you have any questions for me other than